showing all the shell debris and bits of broken um, agate nodules and shards that have been broken off. And to actually get these out of the volcanic rock like this is very hard and usually they break, you can't get them out complete, but they weather out into the soil pro into the soil. So you can just pick a lot of these up on surface like um, they're just as rounded stones. So what we're seeing here is actually broken flakes from tool manufacturing. At this point I'll hand over to Richard and he'll continue the with the archaeological part of this story, talking about flakes. Thank you. There you go. Look, Rich, I can't resist doing this because Richard uh, asked not to be introduced, but it seems to me, especially for those of us who've been here for many years, Richard, of course, is, is a legend in Panamanian archaeology. But for most of us, it's just an incredible pleasure to see him giving a lecture to us after his most recent history. So I, for all his protests, um, I ignored him and decided to give him an introduction and to thank him for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tony. I will talk to you later. <laughs> well, that was a good point um, at which to uh, re-enter the show. Uh, Stuart's showing us the um, uh, source of the agate, which was used to produce 80% of the thousands and thousands of stone tools that were found in these pre-ceramic sites uh, we tested. The, the nodules are fairly small and it required that the artisan smash them on a hard base, what archaeologists call, um, I don't even remember the name in English, a yunke. Uh, smash them on, on a base in a bipolar fashion. So you whack, you whack the nodule and you've got a double force and, uh, from the top and from the bottom, prizing off these rather straight flakes of agate. And you see at the bottom here, under high magnification, there's a two millimeter scale there. That however the small the flake might be, there are lots and lots of tiny but orderly flakes on the edges of these tools, denoting their use on hard surfaces probably bone and palm wood, which were used for making everyday artifacts. These tools were produced um, at the site between 6,000 and 5,600. There is the radiocarbon chronology. Notice how the dates are overlapping. Now this suggests continued occupation. Although with tiny pits like the ones we did, there's no way really you can prove that. Maybe when the site gets opened up and there's a better radiocarbon chronology, you might be able to identify phases of occupation. At the moment, it looks like when the people got there, uh, they lived there for about 4,000 years and then went away. There is, although um, Stuart showed that uh, um, uh, he showed the sea level around 14. 15,000 when people first showed up on the isthmus, and later at about 11,000 when 12,000 when the Clovis people were around. We haven't found any indication of these early human groups on the Pearl Islands. This site is the earliest one we have. And I think it's possible that a combination of late glacial aridity when the islands were connected to the mainland and a fairly large a uh, stretch of water which is opened up by about 9,000 was probably an obstacle by the earlier colonization of the archipelago, both by humans and animals, terrestrial animals. Pre-ceramic sites of a similar age and with similar stone industries, those bi bipolarly um, worked agate industries, have been reported at several sites in central Panama but not yet in uh, Panama province or the Darien. And there are the sites which have produced these um, industries. 
a carabalí en Veraguas, ladrones en Cocle, um, Agua Dulce on the coast of Cocle, and this site here in the very, very humid uh, lowlands of Cocle. That's a site which was discovered and excavated by John Griggs when he was working here in Panama. Also note that sediment core data indicate forest clearance and maize cultivation near Cana in the eastern Darien by 5,000 years ago. Uh, this is well-known research published in the 1990s by Dolores and Paul Collingbaugh. In fact, it, it certainly is no surprise to archaeologists, but might be to, to some members of the audience, uh, bearing in mind the antiquity of the site, that the frequency and size of starch grains on grinding stones suggests the intensive use of maize. See here the numbers, the numbers of starch grains. This work was done, of course, by Irene Holtz. Uh, the numbers of maize grains and the length and width. And these, are, these are measurements which to a, a simple archaeologist might be don't really mean much, but they mean one heck of a lot to people who study the origins and development of um, agriculture. They were using a lot of maize, and occasionally they were using the roots of things like canna. This is probably... Uh, the canna they used today in Panama, a caña agria uh, for medicines. There's a canna in Peru, canna edulis, achira, which is edible, but it's not here in Panama. And um, dioscoria, heliconia tube, some of them are edible, and yam and uh, arrowroot alike, uh, a few uh, starch grains as well. So heavy use of maize and occasional use of. Um, root crops, uh, typical of those pre-ceramic sites on the mainland which I showed you, and there's one of the 20 odd grinding stones uh, at about uh, uh, 160 below the surface at the site, um, at one of the tests in the site. The site is located on a low spur just above the beach. There's the, uh, the, the, the map of the site. We uh, excavated um, two one meter cuts. There they are. There. Oops. I knew that would happen. There you go. There are the two one meter cuts and a three point five meter cut uh, at the edge of the site. We did eighty five auger soundings. That's the northern limit of the site, and this is the edge of the site. We reckon it covers about 1,300 square meters. So there, it was probably an extended family or a couple of extended families uh, living there. Not many people. Um, but uh, the site is, um, is deep. This cut here reached 4.10 meters, 4.1 meters. And this larger cut got to about 3.8 meters but didn't hit the bottom because of water table encroachment, which is a huge problem. There's going to be a, a massive problem for the next archaeological team who goes to work. They're going to have to work with pumps and make sure they pump the site and get down to the basal layers. But at least in two cuts, we got down to the initial occupation of the site. Uh, small, uh, deep test bits are by no means the right way to excavate sites like this. This was just a testing program. But even so, there's quite a clear stratigraphy of um, six strata. The first stratum, uh, very clearly um, demarked in the wall here, is not pre-ceramic. It represents pre-Columbian occupation after 5,600 years. And there are five pre-ceramic strata. Uh, shells are much more abundant in the first stratum here. I, I didn't, I was going to bring some quantifications of the shells, I thought it would clutter things up. But it looks as though shells became increasingly popular as a food source through time, probably in, in the light of declining um, vertebrate uh, animal um, supplies. As you would expect on a coastal site like this, um, about 90 to 100 percent of, of, of vertebrates uh, are, are fish. That all depends on mesh size. We in the field work with a 3.2 millimeter mesh, 
so as not to, to slow things down, and then take column samples and sieve those through down to about 1.0.15 millimeters. And that list of species there is based on a very small sample, um, about um, 0.1 uh, cubic meters taken over the finest mesh. And I just wanted to point out there that there seem to be two uh, fishing patterns, one uh, characterized by fish which swim in clear water currents, not necessarily far offshore, pelagic fish, whoopsie, like the um, like the green jack here, Cochinoa, and Eltinus lineatus, the bonito, which sweep into the bays in big shoals, and I imagine could be caught either with um, gill nets tended, um, thrown out from the small island at the head of the bay, or by trolling. And the other um, um, strategy would be shooting for, fishing for fish from reefs and adjacent sand gravel areas, like uh, Bodianus uh, um, labrid, big labrid, uh, Abadeftic Toshelli pointing out that small reef fish were taken as well, um, and lots of uh, parrotfish. And currently, we are um, pulling out measurable bones in order to uh, use allometry to calculate the size ranges of these fish in the future. The high number of toothed whale bones was quite surprising because uh, this is the only evidence for systematic pre-Columbian exploitation of dolphins between California and Peru at any time period. And it's kind of interesting to find that these first um, uh, occupants who must have had seaworthy boats to cross between 30 and 50 kilometers of choppy seas to reach the island. They knew what they were doing in these boats. And I suspect that the, um, the dolphins were part of a um, uh, sort of trophic hierarchy here, which I'll point out in a minute. Two, two dolphin genera were exploited throughout the pre-Ceramic occupation. By far the most frequent is um, Delphinus, and you can see these cut marks here on its, its um, uh, the articulate of the mandible. And one Delphinus basioctypical has a very obvious puncture wound. Uh, I can't say, no we can't say, whether these were, were, were actually fished or they found the bones freshly dead. Dolphins don't wash up too much, and I suspect this is intentional human predation. Uh, I think this highlights, uh, I say, a trophic hierarchy in the islands of bays. Um, humans and big sharks fed on each other. The big sharks and the humans fed on uh, the big sharks fed on the dolphins, and the humans on the dolphins, the green jacks, and the small fish. Um, and this is, I think, a typical example of, 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 of exploitation of a particular niche. These shallow bays, the, the um, topography is just right to exploit the, the shoaling fish coming in and the dolphins coming in after them and um, uh, using the shark remain, using the shark teeth to make pretty ornaments and brag about how good a huntsman were. I should point out that no shark vertebrae were found in the deposits at all, which is interesting. Um, only teeth, which suggests either that shark were not consumed or that they were killed somewhere else and the meat taken in. No shark vertebrae at all, unlike all other sites I've ever worked in in Panama. 